good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County. And we have a huge group of people here with us today, all learning about pruning. So I guess it's that time of year, something that everybody is thinking about, you know, looking outside. I know I have a lot of dead brown plants out in my yard, and I'm thinking, how am I going to deal with them? Um, let me go ahead and just jump right into the presentation here. So let me hit screen share. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Okay. And we're going to be talking a little bit about pruning. This is a presentation that I created before for, um, we've held expert lawn and landscaping courses in the past, and this is the pruning module. So I figured that this was pretty appropriate for today. Now, like I mentioned, for anybody who just joined us within the last moment or two, um, if you have any questions, go ahead and look at the very bottom of your screen where it says chat and click on that and go ahead and type your question in. And that way at the end, when I'm done screen sharing with the presentation, I can go back and go ahead and go through all the specific questions. So when it comes to pruning, there's a lot of different things that we might prune in our yard. A lot of different plants that you may be dealing with, everything from trees to bushes to perennial plants. So let's start with trees. Keeping trees properly pruned is very, very important because if you just think that they're gonna take care of themselves for many, many years, you have large oak trees on your property and you never check them, you never have them professionally checked, you never prune them or do anything to them, you could be just kind of putting yourself in a position where you're gonna have a problem sometime in the future. So lack of pruning or improper pruning can have some really serious consequences with trees, um, especially large trees. We've all seen on TV after a hurricane or a tropical storm, you'll see on the evening news about the huge oak tree that fell on somebody's house or their trailer and cause a lot of damage or maybe actually hurt somebody. So this is kind of an important topic. A tree that has some has structurally failed once is probably going to fail again. So if you have large older trees and you've had very large branches break off of them and all you did was kind of cut it off and get rid of the large branch, you're probably going to have more problems in the future. And if you have large trees on your property, the time to start pruning them and shaping them and getting them to in the exact shape that you want them to go in is when they're very, very small, either when you just planted them or when they're maybe six feet tall. And you're going to see you're going to take certain steps to get them off on the right track to grow in a way that they're going to be safe and they're not going to need a lot of work or even if worse comes to and you're going to have a large branch break off. So why do we prune plants or tree or... Let me go back. Okay. So when we're talking about plants, why are we going to prune plants? It's to shape them and improve their structural integrity. It's very important that we're going to remove dead, diseased, or crossing branches. As you see, that's basically where you start when you're pruning plants. You may have to restore that plant after a storm, after a freeze. I know that we have gotten some really cold temperatures here in Hernando County this past winter, a little bit colder than in past years. I think it was the day after Christmas, it was 27 in my backyard. And that's pretty cold. That's gonna damage a number of plants. So you may have to kind of prune them back a lot and get them shaped and back on track. Uh, you're gonna to prune to improve the plant appearance, uh, you're going to prune them to thin them a little bit and let more light and air penetrate. That's very important. We're going to get to that topic also. Uh, some plants, you're going to have to remove suckers, the little branches that start popping out where you don't want them to be. Uh, you're going to train and maintain younger plants. And then also controlling plant size. But let me mention that one of the um, most important points of Florida Friendly Landscaping is putting the right plant in the right place. So before you ever put a plant in, you need to think about what is the mature height and width of that plant gonna be and put it in an appropriate spot. People have problems where they'll put 
you know, they'll get a small potted crepe myrtle or other flowering hedge, and they'll put it right next to a sidewalk, right next to their front door. And over time it grows. And now they have a problem with, oh, this plant is, you know, blocking my front door. So I'm going to have to prune it and prune it and prune it. That was just poor planning. You need to plan and pick plants that when they get to their mature size and they flower and they look the way you want them to look, they're still going to fit in the amount of space that you gave them. So controlling plant size is almost more part of proper planning than pruning. So going back to pruning shade trees, just some basics here. And I know that um, we probably don't have any arborists on here with us today or um, people that are tree experts, but just some basics and things that you need to know about trees and keeping them under control. Um, pruning techniques are designed to help to develop and maintain strong structure. So you want that tree to be strong, be able to hold up its branches and handle high winds, an afternoon thunderstorm, or maybe, you know, worst case scenario, hurricane or tropical storm when we have winds come through. So if you do that correctly, trees that are well structured are going to look good. They're going to be the most attractive trees on your property. They are going to be very long lived, poorly maintained and poorly managed trees tend to die early or are in a position where you're going to have to get them removed early. Uh, which can be very, very expensive because they're, you know, causing some kind of problems. Uh, they also have crowns that are preserved as they mature. So structural pruning is important for both young and mature shade trees. So don't think that you can plant a tree and then not have to do anything to it for 20 years, because at that point, it may be a little bit too late to get it back under control. So improper pruning Oh, and here's some pictures and some examples here of really badly managed trees. You see on the right, the upper right hand side, those are large trees that somebody put off maintaining. And I don't know who on earth they had pruned those trees. Hopefully it was not a professional, but they have absolutely butchered them. Those trees, there's a good chance that they're not going to survive. And even if they do, they're never going to look right. Uh, the picture on the bottom left here is something, you know, that you see very commonly in a shopping center or maybe grocery store parking lot. A good example of putting the wrong plant, the wrong tree in the wrong place. Obviously, it was a tree that's going to get way too large for a parking lot, and they've just absolutely hacked that one all. So that's never going to be a very attractive tree. You probably don't want something like that in your front yard. And the bottom right hand picture here is something that you very, very commonly see those are a whole lot of competing leaders on that tree. So a lot of competing, very, very large branches and the junctions between them are very, very weak wood. So every notch there is a potential for disaster. When you let a tree get to the point where it has that many leaders and that many large branches, a lot of times they'll split. And it could happen during a storm it could happen on a calm night. It's just when it's time come, it's going to split and one or more of those large branches are going to come down and hit whatever is below them. So improper pruning harms the plant's health, definitely shortens its lifespan. It makes it unstable, makes it unsightly, so it doesn't look very good. And a lot of times it's going to lead to early tree removal, which can be very, very expensive. So if you do go out and have to prune a few small branches off of a tree, very important that you make your cuts in the right spot. On the um, pictures here, you see the branch collar, and this is the small area where a tree branch attaches to the main trunk. And you need to cut, you don't wanna cut that flush and right up against the tree trunk because it's never gonna heal. I have a few pictures coming up of what happens when you do that incorrectly. You need to move out a couple inches and you're gonna see where the branch collar ends and the branch actually begins. And that's where you wanna cut it because a tree will naturally be able to heal over that cut or that wound at that part and it's gonna heal over. If it doesn't heal over, that open cut is just gonna stay there long-term. And what's gonna happen is insects and diseases are gonna very easily get into the tree and start to cause rot and that's gonna to lead to tree failure. So which one is correct? 
So um, both of these pictures are correct. You have to look for where the branch collar is and cut just beyond the branch collar. You Thank don't want you. to cut through the branch collar or up flush with the um, trunk of the tree. So here on the upper left-hand side where the collar is left intact, that's a good cut. Um, when you cut it, you can kind of tell because if you actually turn around and look at the cut, it's going to be round. It's not going to be oblong. And what happens is relatively quickly within a year or so, it's going to heal over. And now it has new bark on top of it and it's going to help to keep out insects, diseases, and things like that, that if they get into your tree are going to keep going and cause tree failure. Now we get questions sometimes about the old fashioned pruning paint. And I know that when I was young, growing up up north, people would use this on their trees after they prune them. You don't wanna use this here in Florida because what it does is it holds the moisture in and moisture being held right up against the tree underneath that open cut is gonna cause um, fungal problems, possibly mushrooms, the wood is going to rot. So you don't want to put that tree paint. I'm not even sure if they still sell that or not. If you look at an Ace Hardware or somewhere, you could probably still find it. And it may work okay up north, but here in Florida, you do not want to use it. After you cut off a tree branch, you just want to leave it open and let it air dry. And it's going to naturally, if you put the cut in the right spot, heal over without trapping decay and moisture and all kinds of nasty things underneath it. So don't use the black tar paint. So here's a couple of pictures, some examples of poor tree form on the left. They've left a number of uh, larger branches and uh, co-dominant kind of competing branches on it. And the picture on the right is better formed. It's a little bit thinner. You can see that you, if you tra travel all the way from ground level, all the way up, you have the one main trunk up there. So um, that's a good form. Not using the pruning sealer on it. So if you have any questions or problems with trees, you want to consult with an actual arborist. <laughs> International Society of Arboriculture. Um, if there's any way that everybody can go ahead and turn their microphones and their cameras off, that'd be great so that everybody can follow along. So if you're looking for somebody to give you advice on your trees, you need to consult with an actual arborist. So the International Society of Arboriculture or ISA actually certifies arborists. They are trained and tested and knowledgeable in all different aspects of arboriculture or raising trees. They do have practical experience. They have to pass a, an exam. I need to go take my exam as soon as I have some free time. And it's a lot of studying, preparing for that. And they do have a list of certified arborists by area. So if you look online uh, on isa-arbor.com, you can find a list of certified arborists wherever you might live, whether it's in Hernando County or a surrounding county. And um, go ahead and find yourself an arborist that way. They can come out and actually look at a tree, tell you if it is safe, or if it's sick or diseased or needs to be removed, they can tell you actually from looking at the tree what is going on with it. So pruning shrubs. When we get to pruning shrubs, uh, generally they have a lot fewer structural concerns. There's, you know, you can see from these pictures, if a branch breaks and falls off, it's not gonna damage property or injure a person, but you want nice looking healthy shrubs in your property also. A lot of shrubs, here in Central Florida are gonna flower and many of them grow just fine without pruning. Don't think that everything in your yard has to be pruned every spring because a lot of things really don't necessarily need pruning. Now, obviously, because we've had a cold winter, if you have frozen branches and dead branches on it, they do need to be pruned. But if the bush, like uh, on the right-hand side here, the upper one, that, that hedge looks fine. That's, you know, you could let it grow naturally and get a nice natural form. 
is flowering. It looks healthy. I don't see anything on it that needs to be pruned off. The one on the bottom right hand side here was probably placed and planted in the wrong place. It's kind of spilling over and blocking that sidewalk. Might be, you know, a problem. This looks like a downtown area. So that's more poor planting than really poor pruning. Sometimes older shrubs are going to need rejuvenation, or you're going to have to remove some of that older or, or diseased or damaged wood. And we're going to touch on that. And the main reason for pruning shrubs is going to be re to reduce their size a little bit. And like I said, if you plan really well and you take into account the mature size of that bush and you put it in a spot where it's going to grow to full size and not block or bother anything or anybody, that is absolutely perfect. You're probably not going to have to prune it much. So like I said, a lot of shrubs can be very, very low maintenance if you just put it in the right location. So here's a picture of a dwarf Burford holly. And its mature height is not going to be a whole lot bigger than this. And it's obviously in a spot where it can grow and spread. It's not going to cause too many problems. And it should need a minimum of pruning right there. You may want to shape it up a little bit. But other than that, not going to need a whole lot of work. Uh, sometimes you may inherit problems. So this applies to people who may have, have moved to the area and bought a house. And you kind of inherit the poor planning and plants and issues that came with the house. I know that I have a queen palm tree out in front of my house that came with the house and it was planted too close to the house. Not by much, it should have been planted. If it, they put it three feet further out, it would have been perfect. But now it's in a spot where the leaves tend to droop a little bit and lay on the roof of the house. So I'm having to prune it more often than I should because they put it in the wrong spot. Some of these pictures here, the upper picture that was planted in a very narrow area right next to a street, now it's spilling over. That's going to take a lot of maintenance. It's never going to look very good. Older bushes or neglected bushes or things that get very, very large, if you put too many of them right in front of your house, are going to block the house, and then that's going to be a problem. Your house starts to look really overgrown, maybe starts to look a little haunted, if you know the bushes just get way too big. So there might be times if you inherit something that was just put in a really bad or really wrong place, you may have to actually remove it. That may be your only option. So thinning bushes, sometimes large older shrubs just get too thick. They get way too many branches coming out of the ground in the center of the shrub. So you're going to have to go through and remove as much as one third of them in the spring. And you're going to look for number one, dead branches, because dead branches never come back to life and get better. So start with the dead ones. Look for branches that are crossing each other and they're crossing and rubbing. You need to cut off one or the other, because if they keep rubbing, they're going to rub the bark off of each other. And that's a really good way to get diseases in. So be on the lookout for crossing branches and take out one or the other. And this could be done once a year, but really only once a year is appropriate, usually in the spring. So go through and remove some branches. You can take out as much as one third each year to open the bush up a little bit, let a little fresh air and sunshine in and let a little airflow in. And that's gonna greatly reduce diseases, insect problems, and you're going to get a lot of healthy new growth on that bush also. So like I said, you need to start with removing dead or severely diseased damaged wood. So start with that first. Uh, choose some of the thickest, oldest stems and cut them back to about four to six inches tall. Some of the oldest stems should be cut back to their point of origin. So that's going to be either where they connect to a larger stem or all the way back to the ground. And then cut back <clears throat> any of those stems that get a little overly aggressive. And you always seem to have that one or two stems that stick way out to the left or way out to the right and look really, really bad. Those are good candidates to cut way back also. So you see the pictures here of the like before and after. That's what it should look like. And what that does is it opens up the interior to better airflow and encourages some new growth, some new fresh growth it's probably going to flower better and long term be a much healthier plant or hedge. 
Some plants, um, if they grow more like a cane, you, like I said, you can remove as much as one third of the tallest, oldest crossing canes each year. Because what happens is without any pruning at all, they tend to get taller and taller. And now they get very, very leggy and bare underneath. And you have really unusual kind of unattractive bushes growing in your landscape. So informal hedges, if they're not pruned to be a specific shape or pruned to be round or like shaped like a column, more informal free flowing type hedges, they're definitely lower maintenance. They're gonna require a lot less pruning because you're not trying to keep them to a very specific shape. Um, you can do some reduction or heading cuts and that's gonna be on the longest shoots that are sticking out. So pick out some of the longest, most aggressive branches, follow them back down and cut them to about six to 18 inches. And you can see from the pictures here, the upper picture, that looks fine. That's a very nice looking natural hedge, a little hard to tell exactly what kind of plant it is, but it flowers. And if you maintain it like that, it should flower really well long-term. The picture on the bottom here, and I think we all see this a lot, these are hedges that they probably just allowed to get way too out of control. And they thought, oh my, these hedges are like 10 feet too tall. We have to cut them back severely. And when you do this, it looks, it looks terrible right now. It's gonna look terrible for a while. They may recover and come back, but it's gonna take a long time for the new growth to get to the point where it covers all those large stems, the big cuts. And if this is a flowering hedge, it's gonna take a long time for it to grow back to the point where it's gonna to start to flower again and look good in your landscape because the reason why you have flowering plants is for them to flower. So upper picture, good. Bottom picture, bad. And I see that quite a bit in a lot of neighborhoods. So formal hedges, the ones that you want to keep to a very specific, you know, square or rectangular shape, that's going to take a lot more maintenance. Um, a lot of people um, get in the position where they prune these hedges and they try to keep them to a specific shape. And every time it grows a few branches and some new leaves, they clip it off. Grows a little bit more, they clip it off. So what happens is with these hedges over time, they get a lot of old leaves and old wood on them and eventually they start to decline. So if you see the um, picture down here, the bottom right hand corner where it says bad, that's just been maintained where the hedges have been allowed to get way too thick. There's no airflow inside, no sunlight is penetrating the top and getting inside to stimulate any kind of new growth in the, in the interior. So that's that's going to be a really difficult plant or hedge to fix, basically. That's going to be a tough one. So when you're pruning your hedges, you always want to make sure they're a little bit more narrow at the top and wider at the bottom, a little bit like a pyramid, because that way they're going to get more and better light all the way to the bottom. If you do it the opposite, where they're wider on the top and narrower on the bottom, they tend to tend to get thinner and thinner down near the bottom. And now you have problems where your hedge is all just branches and twigs at the bottom and all the foliage is at the top. So that's a little bit more difficult to cure also. Like you see the picture at the bottom here of the hedge. That's going to be a difficult one to get back into shape and make it look attractive. So um, sometimes to reduce the size of a formal shrub, instead of just maintaining it at the exact height you want it, sometimes in the spring, you may need to cut it back shorter than that and just give it a chance to grow back a little bit. What's going to happen is if you cut it one or two feet below where you ideally want it, it gives it a chance to get new leaves, new branches, new growth until it gets back up to your your cutoff point, the height or size that you need to keep it at, and you're going to end up with more healthy leaves and healthy growth inside the plant. That's the kind of thing that you want to do right about now, late winter, early spring. This is late January right now. Of course, more frost sensitive plants, you probably want to wait a little bit longer until March until hopefully all the freezes and frosts are over with. 
but you could do it. You could start planning on it and doing it pretty soon. So renovating, if you have a plant that's just completely overgrown and it's just totally out of bounds, you can prune it back severely in the late winter or early spring for something that's called rejuvenation. And you can see this, uh, this is a holly here that obviously got way too big, way too out of control. There are some plants that you can literally hack all the way back to the ground and you won't kill them. They'll grow back. It'll take a long time. And you're going to have to keep an eye on it because as it grows back, you need to control what kind of shape you want it to go in. So this is a pretty extreme situation here, this picture on the right. One that they hacked back to, that's probably about knee high. And it's still alive. And it has new growth and it will grow back. You're going to have to watch it to make sure it grows back in the shape and form that you want it to grow back in. Eventually, it will kind of cover over that ugly looking stump and the big, you know, cut on it. So long term, it will probably be an attractive holly once again, but it's going to take some time for that to kind of get back to being an attractive plant in your yard. So when to, to prune? A lot of trees and shrubs can be pruned lightly pretty much any time. So those hedges that you have to keep to a certain size or your plants that might uh, have a branch or two that are sticking out over a sidewalk or blocking your front door. You can trim a little bit pretty much any time of year. A lot of shrubs to flower for just a short time every year. And some examples would be azaleas, camellias, uh, gardenias are another one on this list. So the uh, azaleas flower in the early spring. What you wanna try your very best to do is when they're done flowering, go out there and prune them and prune them back shorter if you have to, go through them, remove dead branches, crossing branches, all that, and try to prune them just once per year and let them grow back for the whole summer, the fall. And then once you get to next spring, you are gonna get by far the best flowering off of them. If you have azaleas and you try to maintain them as a formal hedge and you're out there all summer long, either you or your service, and you're trim, 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 taking a little bit off, they grow two inches, you take two inches off, you're probably not gonna get a whole lot of flowering the next spring. Because what you're doing is you're always cutting off the um, new growth on it. So other flowering shrubs, the flower on new growth can be pruned during the dormant season, which is right now. So like I said, if you have flowering bushes that are fairly hardy, not bothered a whole lot by freezes, you can start pruning them pretty soon. We're really still a little bit early right now for most flowering bushes, but soon you can start pruning them. And then structural pruning can be done most any time during the year. So when you're out there pruning, you need the proper equipment. If you have something small, a little branch, a good pair of bypass hand pruners is very, very important. Get a quality pair of pruners clean it and keep it stored, keep it well oiled, keep the blade sharpened on it. And that's gonna work really well and make a nice clean cut on little branches. If the branch is too thick to, for, to cut with that, you would move to loppers next, which loppers are like the large hand pruners. And they can cut off up to small branches. If the branch is too thick for loppers, you need to get a nice folding pruning saw. And I can tell you from experience, if your saw is old, and you go out there and start using it, it's gonna work, you know, you're gonna cut the branch off. But if you go out and invest in a nice new quality pruning saw, oh my gosh, the brand new ones are sharp and you go out there and just start sawing, it's like, oh my gosh, it, it'll zip right through it. There's like, the difference is like between night and day between a new sharp pruning saw and maybe a very, very old rusty one, they need to be replaced on some kind of regular basis. And for palm trees or things that you can't reach, a pole saw is very important. And basically that's a pruning saw on a large stick. And if you are physically capable of it and you follow the proper safety procedures and you know exactly where to make the cuts, you can use a chainsaw and that's what you're gonna to have to use for larger branches. Like I said, for large tree work, you want to be smart and you want to be safe. 
you probably want to consult with a certified arborist if you have questions about a tree. There are other tree services that are not certified arborists. And you, if you have a tree that you know for a fact this tree must come down, you can talk with one of them and get quotes on just getting the tree removed. You always want to double check that they have the proper insurance, they have the proper licenses, because they are doing very, very dangerous work on your property. And you want to make sure that if you're doing the work, you don't get injured. And if they're doing the work and somebody gets injured, you're not liable for it. So uh, your pruning tools do need a certain amount of maintenance. <clears throat> you always want to try to keep them cleaned, wiped off, free from rust. You want to remove any dirt, soil, bark. Um, a lot of times if you're using it on plants, you'll get sticky sap on it. You want to clean all that off. Keep the blades sharp and keep them well lubricated in oil. I tell you what, cutting with sharp blades is so much better and easier than cutting with dull blades. I know that every time I sharpen my blades, I'm like, oh my gosh, I should have done this sooner or more often. It just makes a huge difference. So with that, if anybody has any questions, let me go ahead and get out of screen sharing here. So, oh my goodness, let me scroll all the way up to the very top of the questions here and go through this. I already mentioned that we are recording this. So this recording will be available. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but it will be available on Lily's Florida Friendly Landscape Facebook page and also on the Hernando County YouTube site. And we'll probably go ahead and share it on our Facebook page also. Um, David asks about pruning grapevines and crepe myrtles. Grapevines have to be pruned a very specific way. If you look online and you Google University of Florida uh, muscadine grapes, you can find a lot of information because I, I would hope that you're growing muscadine grapes because they're the only ones that are gonna grow well here in Hernando County or Central Florida. Any other like European wine grapes are gonna get a disease called Pierce's disease and die. So hopefully you're growing muscadines and if you look online, University of Florida has an actual um, guide with pictures and diagrams exactly how to maintain those vines, depending on how old they are. They take very specific pruning. So that's why I'm not even going to try to, to describe it and act it out here. Crepe myrtles, crepe myrtles, you can start pruning back probably now. Uh, or you can wait until February. Generally, the best time for them is February. With crepe myrtles, all you have to prune off is just the old spent flowers and seed heads. If you have any branches that are crossing, you need to take off one or the other. If you have any little sprouts that are popping up from down near ground level, you can cut them totally off also. Other than that, crepe myrtles really don't need a whole lot of pruning. If you let them go and get to their mature size, you're gonna get much more flowering much better flowering and the plants are going to be healthier overall. We don't recommend the uh, the serious trimming back or hat racking or some people call it crepe murder. Then I'm sure you have neighbors, I have neighbors that go out there and every spring cut them way, way, way back. That's really bad for crepe myrtles and totally unnecessary. That does them no good from a plant health perspective. So will we get a copy of the presentation? Um, if you give me just a second, I will go ahead and put my email in the chat box. So I put my email wlester at ufl.edu down in the chat box. If you guys want to scroll down there and get that. If you'd like a copy of the slides, just go ahead and send me an email and I'll go ahead and email you a PDF copy of that. And let me go back up and roll through some questions here. We have people from Hillsborough River State Park, Ranger Val. Good morning, Ranger Val, how are you? I guess we have people from all over here tuning in today. Um, question about pruning a camellia bush. 
Camellias don't need a lot of pruning. Camellias flower in the, in the like late winter. So they're flowering right now, all depending on what variety of camellia you have. So camellia, you need to just prune out any dead branches because like I said, dead branches are not gonna get better and recover. Um, you wanna take out uh, any crossing branches, you know, take out either one or the other. If you have to prune the camellia back to be a little bit shorter because it's just gotten too tall, you could do that right after it's done flowering. And then after that, camellias, if it's a good shape and it's a good size, it's not causing any problems, really camellias really don't need a whole lot of pruning. Just looking mostly for dead wood and dead branches. That's the biggest problem with camellias is keeping that stuff out of there. So uh, Lisa Baker asks, how do I prune my loquat trees? Loquat trees don't need much pruning other than if they've gotten too large. So you have to prune them back to make them a little bit shorter. So if you start with removing dead branches, disease branches, crossing branches, you can prune back a few branches, take the branch all the way back to where it connects to a larger branch and cut it there. You don't want to ever prune trees and loquats are small trees you don't want to prune them like a bush where you just kind of cut all through all the branches to make it into a shape because then every place where you cut, you're going to get new little branches that try to come out and that's going to cause a lot of problems long term. Um, any questions, specific questions about specific trees like avocado trees, mango trees, if you look online. University of Florida has a lot of really good information about how to prune those. And it's gonna depend on exactly where you live also. So how you prune mangoes and avocados in let's say Miami and Homestead is different than how you're gonna prune them here in Hernando County, because here in Hernando County, they grow a lot slower. Down in Homestead, you have to prune them every year. The commercial growers down there prune them every year. Here in Hernando County, they grow a lot slower and you're going to prune them a lot less. Uh, so we already covered copy of the presentation. Um, we have people here from St. Pete. Um, pruning to shorten a magnolia tree. You really want to put magnolia trees in a place where you're never going to have to shorten them or make them smaller, which means you're gonna to have to put them in a spot where um, they, here, hold on a second. Um, okay, sorry. You wanna put them in a spot where they're gonna be able to grow to maturity without needing pruning. Magnolias, you can look through it and remove any dead branches or dead growth um, you can, if it's getting too tall, cut some of the top branches back part way. Like I said, you really want to put a magnolia tree in a spot where you're not going to have to prune it a whole lot. Um, here's a good question. Are there any special issues when pruning newly planted oaks in a housing development? You really don't want to prune oaks. You don't want to maintain an oak tree the same way you would a, um, a, let's say, hedge bush, because then you're going to have a, a lot of problems with it. Because like I said, if you maintain an oak tree like a bush, at every point where you cut a branch, you're going to get new little sprouts coming out. And eventually your oak tree is going to be really, really super dense at the outer edges. And it's going to get thinner on the inside. And long term, you will turn your oak tree into an absolute disaster. I've seen some uh, shopping centers and businesses that have oak trees that they maintain in a great big ball shape. And they have to have them pruned every month or two. So it gets very expensive for them. Those oak trees are never going to live to be, you know, 50 or 100 years old. They're going to have a much shorter life from maintaining them like that. So if you have oak trees in a housing development and they don't have enough room to grow to their mature height and width, that is going to be a problem. 
you may want to seriously think about or look at removing them before they become a big expensive problem because I get phone calls sometimes from subdivisions where they have planted oak trees in a spot where there just was not enough room for them to grow, like the strip of grass between a sidewalk and a street, and they get really large. They're popping up the sidewalks and they say, what do we do? The only thing you can do is have them removed, and that's going to cost about $1,000 per tree. You multiply that times however many trees are in the neighborhood, that's a pretty big bill to be paying the tree service. But unfortunately, if it gets to that point, that's your only option. So take a few steps back and make sure you plan really, really well exactly where you're going to put these trees so that they're not going to be an expensive nightmare 10 years down the road. So Burns says he has a Haas avocado. Um, he thinks most of the tree grew from the sucker instead of the one main graft. I want to cut off everything but that branch, I believe, is the original one. It's been in for eight years. It's come from the Rare Fruit Council, and he is in Manatee County. With an avocado tree, you're just going to have to stand there. And the smartest thing you could do is before you start pruning a tree, stop. Stand there and take a really, really close look at it and figure out what is the main leader or the main branch that I definitely want to keep in this tree. How many other smaller main branches or leaders can I remove safely without having to cut a gargantuan branch? So you may have to end up leaving more than one leader or main branch, but you wanna keep it as close to one as you can and stop and think and come up with kind of plan like, okay, uh, here's the main leader, I wanna keep that. I have to keep another big branch or two so I'm gonna take off that one and that one and that one, track them all the way back to the main branch. Where people run across a lot of problems is if they just go out there and say, my avocado tree needs to be pruned, it has too many branches, and they just start chopping away. They cut the branches only part way back where they should cut them all the way back to the root collar, like I covered that safe spot where it's safe to cut back a branch where the tree is gonna naturally reheal and heal itself and cover it over. And that's the way you want to go. So put a little bit of planning into it first. Um, Carol wants to know once again about crepe myrtles. Like I said, if you look up University of Florida information, there is a ton of it out there on crepe myrtles. Crepe myrtles need less pruning as opposed to more pruning. All you really have to take off is the dead growth, the suckers that are coming up from the ground and crepe myrtles tend to get a lot of suckers. So cutting them off, all the suckers that are coming off the, the main stem down close to the ground or out of the ground, completely remove them. Um, and other than that, you don't have to cut all the branches off. You don't have to strip a crepe myrtle back. There is nothing good from a plant health perspective that that accomplishes. And if you say, well, I have to cut my crepe myrtle back that short because otherwise it blocks my driveway or my sidewalk or my front door, that means that crepe myrtle was put in the wrong place. So that kind of goes back to right plant in the right place and just kind of poor planting. So you may want to think about trying to move that crepe myrtle or removing it and putting another crepe myrtle in a more appropriate place. Uh, got questions about pomegranates, and pomegranates are, um, hold on just a second here, a specific plant. Pomegranates don't need a whole lot of pruning. Once again, trim out the dead branches, crossing branches, overly aggressive branches. The one little branch is sticking just way, way, way off to the left-hand side. You can cut it back. Pomegranates, you should generally let grow. Uh, pomegranates, the larger it gets, the more new growth it gets, the more it's going to flower, and the more pomegranate fruits you can potentially get off of it. And you can actually grow pomegranates here in Florida and get fruit off of them too. Uh, Kaina asks, how do I prune my two-year-old lemon tree? Citrus needs basically no pruning other than dead branches, crossing branches, wonky branches. That's what we're going to start calling them, the ones that stick way out in the left field or right field. Um, 
And then as the citrus tree gets older and larger and taller, you can start removing the bottom branches, especially if those branches are now laying on the ground, because any branches that lay on the ground in the dirt is a bad thing. That makes them very susceptible to diseases and insect pests and snails and a lot of different things. So take off just the bottom branches. Other than that, citrus, you can go a very long time with citrus and not prune it. Citrus does not need a whole lot of pruning. So, um, so Maria, once again, I just talked about citrus trees, already covered avocado. That's a site specific kind of issue. Avocados in South Florida have to be pruned. Here in Central Florida, if you have an avocado that's surviving the freezes, you're going to have to prune off the dead frozen branches every spring. Other than that, if you take off dead branches, crossing branches, and wonky branches, avocados need don't require a lot of pruning. Uh, when is the best time to prune a sweet bay magnolia? Pretty much any time of year. Sweet bay magnolias are very hardy trees, so they're not very frost sensitive. If it is, hopefully it's a, still a small tree and your pruning is actually gonna help to shape it better and keep the number of main branches and leaders down. That is a good thing. And you could do that any time of year. If it is a really huge sweet bay that's never been pruned before and now it's out of control, gonna be a little tougher to accomplish. You may need to call an arborist to have you actually advise you on what to cut and what not to cut. Um, another camellia question. Boy, you guys have a lot of camellias growing out here. Um, like I already said, camellias can get too big and they can get leggy over time. The best time to prune them at all is right after they flower and then let them grow back for the rest of the year. That way the next late winter, you're gonna get maximum flower production off of it. If camellias have gotten leggy and too thick, you can um, thin them and rejuvenate them, which is stand there and take a hard look at them and pick out a few of the oldest biggest branches and cut them all the way back, either all the way back to the ground or all the way back to the main stem they connect to and open it up a little bit so that it's going to get a little thicker and fuller in the interior. And if it's too tall, you can cut it back a little bit shorter, generally no more than one third of the height of the bush. Uh, leaf miners on lemon trees. <clears throat> Leaf miners are a very common problem on any kind of citrus. Um, if you have leaf miners on only a few leaves, it's not a really big problem. If you have a huge problem with leaf miners and you have a citrus tree and you have lots and lots of leaves that are affected, the one chemical control that works very well on that is spinosad, S-P-I-N-O-S-A-D, or Spinosa. And if you look online, you could order it online. There are some um, nurseries and big box stores to carry that also. But that is about the only chemical control for leaf miners that's going to actually work. Um, going through, we got a couple other questions here that I think I've kind of already answered a little bit. Um, we still have, and I can repeat one more time for everybody on here. Yes, if you came in late or if your internet dropped you off of Zoom a couple times, I know that happens. Some people drop off, come back on, drop off, come on. So they miss a lot. I am recording this and the recording will be on Lily's Florida Friendly Landscape uh, Facebook page. It will be on our Facebook page also. Um, our short name is Hernando EXT, short for Hernando Extension, or University of Florida Extension in Hernando County. If you're not already a follower of ours, if you haven't already liked us, please do so. You need to do that today. And this will also be on the Hernando County's YouTube page. If you go on YouTube and look up Hernando County Government, they have a YouTube page. And this presentation along with all of our previous classes 
is going to be on there also. It's going to take us at least a couple days to get this video kind of finished up and posted up there on YouTube, but it'll be up there in a couple days. And that way you can watch the entire thing all the way through if you miss something. Um, have a question about pruning roses. If you live in Central Florida, roses don't do really well here. If you live south of Central Florida, south of Hernando County and South Florida, Roses do a little bit worse there. Roses have a tough time in Florida because it gets so hot and steamy during the summer. So roses, you can prune back a little bit pretty much any time of year to try to take out the really seriously um, diseased branches, crossing branches. Roses are going to be tough. Unless you grow the uh, native southern roses, Florida cracker roses and things like that, a lot of the hybrid tea roses that maybe you grew up north are going to be difficult to grow here in Florida. But you can prune them back if you need to a little bit pretty much any time of year. Uh, question from Betty Lynch here about palms and removing them. Palm trees, honestly, are pretty easy to cut down. If it's dead and has to be cut down, you just cut it down at ground level and be very, very careful. It does not fall on you or a vehicle or your house or anything else. If it's something a little bit bigger than what you can handle, you definitely want to call a tree removal service and speak with a couple different companies to get prices on that. Or you can call an arborist if you're not sure if the palm tree is healthy or needs to be removed or not. And if you have any palm tree questions, you can email me or contact our office directly so that we can figure out what kind of palm you have. If you send us pictures, we can tell an awful lot from that when it comes to palm trees. Palm trees do have certain diseases and problems, but not many of them. They tend to be kind of easy to diagnose. Um, had a few people who already uh, had to leave and are gonna be watching the recording. Uh, question about, when do you prune frost damaged branches, spring or now? It's best to wait until spring. I tell people as a general rule, March 15th is a very good date. Um, pretty much around St. Patrick's Day, I believe. At that point, we usually are done with freezes and frosts. If you feel confident that the freezes and frosts in your yard and your neighborhood are all done, then you're safe to go out there and prune everything. If you prune it too early and we get another freeze or frost, especially a bad one, your plant may already be shooting out new growth that's very small and tender, and it will get frozen. It will get some serious damage. So it's usually best to wait until you're confident that the freezes and frosts are all done with. And of course, that's going to be different if you live in Jacksonville or you live in Hernando County, or if you live even just a little south of here in uh, Pinellas or Hillsborough County, it's going to really depend on exactly where you live. So I think we need to kind of finish it up here. We'll go ahead and look for any other questions here in the chat box. Um, okay, we have a, a specific question here. From Benjamin, he said, would you recommend ignoring the one third rule if you're aiming to prune your hedge, like a viburnum, uh, to fill in the ground or near ground level with foliage? You could, it all depends on exactly how tall the hedge is right now, and almost more important, how thick it is. Because a lot of times, hedges, as they grow taller, and a lot of people will have a viburnum, let's say privacy hedge between you and the neighbor, and you want it to be 10 foot tall, and you can do that. You have to be careful the hedge doesn't get too thick because when it gets too thick, the inside gets dark and the bottom part gets too dark. So now when it's sitting in the dark, the interior of the bush, the leaves and branches are gonna die and it's not gonna get new growth to fill in and keep it thick and the growth down near the ground level or bottom is gonna to get too dark 
and you're going to start losing leaves and branches in the bottom. So what you end with eventually is a nice 10 foot tall viburnum hedge, but the bottom two feet are just branches and twigs and trunks and stems and no foliage. So thinning it out really well, and then probably cutting it back some to let more light in near the bottom is really going to help. And viburnums are very good about if you give them more airflow and more light, they will respond by shooting out more branches and more new growth. So with the viburnum, it is possible to kind of get it back into shape following uh, or mostly aiming to give it more light at the center and the bottom, which is really going to stimulate that new growth. So I see that it's about 11 a.m. here, and I need to go in just a moment. For anybody here who is watching, if you have any other questions, if you contact me, and I think we have Teresa on here. Teresa, if you would be so kind as to start putting some of our contact information, our phone number and everything in the chat box, you can give us a call if you have a question. You can email us, and a lot of times if you email a specific situation with pictures, make sure they're good, clear pictures, we can tell an awful lot from that and help you out also. Or if you live in Hernando County, stop by our office. We are open now. We are following CDC guidelines for COVID protection and asking that you wear a mask when you come by the office. But you can come by the office and bring in pictures or samples. Uh, people will come in with a sample of a problem lawn or leaves or branches off a bush, or maybe you found a mysterious insect in your house and you don't know what it is. Just throw it in a jar and bring it by the office. We can figure out what it is pretty easily. So if you go ahead and contact us, we are more than happy to try our best to answer all the different various questions that you might have. If you are watching from another county, you know you have a county extension office also. There are 67 counties in Florida and every county has an extension office. If you look online or get in touch with us, we can give you the contact information for your extension office and you can go ahead and ask them because I see people are from Gainesville and Brevard County and Charlotte County and from all, as somebody said earlier, they're from Ohio. I'm not an expert on plants growing up in Ohio and bushes and this and that. So if you check with your local um, extension office, they're gonna be more familiar with exactly what is going on in your county and how to deal with it. Because like I'm familiar with avocados, but as you, you, deal, you manage them differently in Homestead than you do in Pinellas County, than you do in Hernando County, than you do in Gainesville. So a lot of these things are site specific and you're really gonna wanna contact somebody who's able to help you in your own specific spot there. So I see that Teresa put in the chat box, if you scroll all the way down, our phone number is 352-754-4433. And if you give us a call, Teresa will probably be the one to answer and we'll go ahead and help you out and get your specific questions answered for you that way. So hopefully everybody has had a chance to scroll down and copy that information down. Oh my gosh, we have people from Indian River County. We have people from all over Florida here today, which is great. We really, really like when people tune in and join in. And don't forget, tomorrow, Thursday, every Thursday morning, we have a regular virtual plant clinic. If you go to our Facebook page or email Teresa or contact the office, we'll send you the link and the information about that. What that is, is every Thursday morning at 10 a.m., I'm on live on Facebook Live. We're also on YouTube Live for people who don't have Facebook. Anybody can log on to YouTube Live. And we do nothing but answer your questions. So you're able to participate and type your questions in live as you're watching on either Facebook or YouTube. And we answer your questions. I usually have a guest host and guest speakers to help me answer the hard questions. And... We've been able to turn that into a regular podcast, so that is available, and a couple of past episodes are available on a couple podcasting platforms, so we're doing a lot. We're trying our best to do a lot of exciting things, so everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Oh my gosh, I see Pinellas County, I see Sarasota, I see South Georgia. 
So see, we're even going nationwide right now. So thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. And let me go ahead and wrap up. And thank you. And please be sure to tune into all of our future classes. Thank you very much. Bye.